Awesome. I see a few more of you have joined us in the meantime. Hello, everybody. Um, looks like we've got about a 90 participants so far. We're um, here a little early. We're still getting things set up, but um, thanks for joining us. I thought it'd be kind of fun um, while we're waiting, since a few of you are early. If you want to find that chat box at the bottom of your computer screen on that black toolbar at the bottom of your computer screen, um, chat in where you're, where you're sitting from, um, where you're joining us from. Type in your town or or city, um, it'd be great to get an idea of where everyone's coming from. Snohomish, Vancouver, we got Lake Oswego, Gresham, Eagle Creek, Camas, Washington, CU, Seattle, Tualatin, oh, they're just coming in now. Spokane, White Salmon, <laughs> nice to see you guys. We got another white salmon, another white salmon, Vancouver, Garden Home, Woodby Island, Washington. Thanks for joining us. North Plains, thanks for joining us. Estacada, awesome. Horse Grove, Mosier. Thanks for joining us, you guys. I guess while everyone's here too, um, it looks like Bothell, Washington. Thank you, Hood River. Preston, Washington, Fairview, Oregon. Gaston, Oregon. Awesome. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Um, I had folks type in where they're joining us from. And um, on the chat box, we got a lot of great fun areas been, all across I've Washington. Been I've been oh, listening. awesome. Someone awesome. Found, I heard you say someone from Bothell, and that's very close to uh, my high school, my Terrace. There you go. So we still got those pouring in. Right now we have about 134 folks. Pendleton, Oregon, thank you. Corbett. So we'll give everyone a few more minutes. Looks like we got two minutes till 6.30. Give you guys a little bit more time to join us. Natasha, how did you guys uh, decide? I saw you've got bees, turtles, and uh, pika. How did you mm -hmm. decide those and how did you decide pika? You know, um, a few of us here at Friends have been interested in pikas for a while. It's just been kind of a, a fun thing that we wanted to learn about. <laughs> There's not a whole lot um, out there about that population in the gorge. So we were really interested in, in talking about that. And um, with our Western Pond Turtle Project that we got going on with the Oregon Zoo and um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, US Forest Service, um, that kind of lined up too. I just thought that was a really interesting species that we should cover. Yeah. And of course, native bees in the gorge, just with all everything they do for us. I thought, oh, those are those are all three very different species, but um, yeah. Yeah, great species to cover in the gorge. So no certain, I guess, organization around that, but I just thought they were all interesting. <laughs> wow. Ben, Oregon, Sandy, thank you guys. I'm happy everyone's found the chat box. Um, I guess while everyone's here, we got about 175 or 170 now. Um, Oregon Zoo volunteer, thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, there's also a Q&A box available to you guys. Uh, same, that black bar on the bottom of your computer screen, it says Q&A. And um, for the presentation, once Stephen gets started, we're gonna use that Q&A for questions for Stephen. So if you have any questions regarding the presentation, please leave them in the Q&A box. If you have questions for me about friends or um, anything maybe about the Zoom experience that you got going on right now, please put that in the chat box for me. And of course, know that everyone will see that. Also, just to make this conversation a little bit more fun and engaging while we're all at home, um, we're gonna let everyone raise their hand. Um, there's a raise your hand feature. If you click the participants icon, you'll see a feature that says raise hand. And once you raise your hand, I can call out and um, unmute you temporarily so you can ask Stephen your question personally if you're interested in that. Um, love to hear your guys' voices. And uh, we'll take those throughout the presentation as we can while we have time. And um, here we go. And 
then I just had a question about how long is this program? Um, we're gonna go for about an hour. We're gonna aim at um, stopping here at about um, 7.20, 7.30-ish, and then go on to Q&A. And uh, hopefully have plenty of time for that, but um, the presentation will be roughly about an hour. And I see a few folks have raised their hands. I'm gonna get to you guys here. All right, so it looks like Leslie has a question. I'm gonna let you talk real quick, Res Leslie, and then we're gonna get this going. Leslie, can you hear us? You'll just have to unclick your mute button. There you uh, I don't have a question other than <laughs> <laughs> I know what that is. All right, thanks, Leslie. Yep. And then it looks like uh, we got one more. I'll allow you to talk doula. Thanks for joining us. Go ahead and unmute your button. Jill, are you still there? I unmute. I mean, I'm muted. And, and oh, there you go. We can hear you. Okay. Now you want me to unmute it. You're unmuted. You're good if you, yep. If you have a question. Oh no, I don't have a question. But I'm excited about this. I think these little animals are so cute. Well, thank right. you. Glad to have you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> I, wait, I am wondering, um, if you happen to pick one up, would they bite you? I, my guess is they would. They would be petrified, but you don't have to worry about that. You can't pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt that I'll be high enough to uh, find them anyway, but so this, this is a nice introduction. Yeah, I've heard of them running over people's shoes or... Um, I one time saw them in the gorge when I wasn't looking for them. I was sitting down for a little lunch and it popped out and it was a couple feet from me, but um, I've never touched one. Oh, how cute. That's neat. Oh, yeah. that's a gift from nature. Indeed it is. All right, Dula, thank you. I'm gonna mute you so we can get things going on here. Thank you for joining okay. us. Thank you. Natasha, yes. we have a question about whether the program will be recorded. The program will be recorded and it will be available online. Uh, we'll post it as soon as we can, whether that's uh, probably early tomorrow morning, it will be recorded and you guys can share it with anyone who couldn't make it with us live. Thank you for the question, Ryan. And just a reminder to everybody who's raised their hand, if you have asked your question or you don't actually want to ask a question, please lower your hand. Otherwise, we'll call on you later. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Alrighty, so can everyone, um, of course my screen is up, Gorgeous Wildlife Pika. This is the first of the three-part series, um, Gorgeous Wildlife, with Friends of the Columbia Gorge and Stephen Clark. And um, Stephen, your video just turned off, I just wanted to let you know, sorry, <laughs> just to make sure. But um, thanks for joining us everybody. I see there's about 220 of you here now, which is awesome. Um, we did cap out at 500, so I'm sure a, a few more are going to join us throughout this presentation, so we're gonna get going here. Um, if you're new to Zoom, of course, just running through a few things uh, to quickly familiarize you, your microphone is muted. Um, that's why we can't hear you talk, and that is because with so many of us here together, it's best to give everyone the best chance to hear clearly without each other's background noise. Um, if you have a question for Stephen Clark or anything related to the presentation, please type your question into the Q&A box below in that black bar at the bottom of your computer screen. Um, if you don't see the toolbar, go ahead and just give your mouse a little shake and it'll come up. If you have a question for me about Zoom or friends, um, please send me that question in the chat box and me, uh, or excuse me, me or Ryan is going to try to get through them as the presentation goes, but we're going to try to keep things moving. Um, of course, uh, type your question into the chat box and click send. If uh, you'd rather um, talk to us personally, you can again raise your hand. You'll find that icon if you press participants at the bottom. Um, you'll see raise hand come up. You just click it and we'll try to get to everyone as we can. Again, with this presentation only being about an hour and with there being a few hundred of you guys, um, we're just going to try our best to get to everybody in the time. 
All right. Um, all right. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Natasha Stone, and I'm your host. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist here at Friends of the Columbia Gorge. As Friends' Community Engagement Specialist, I manage our outdoor youth education efforts and work to build a diverse and inclusive network of community partners to help protect, preserve, and steward the Columbia Gorge. With me is our featured speaker, Stephen Clark, who is a biologist and professor at Clark College with over a decade of experience researching pica here in the Gorge. Clark holds a Master of Science in Environmental Sciences and Resources at Portland State University. His research background is largely in the Gorge, first by reintroducing the Washington State Endangered Western Pond Turtle at Pierce National Wildlife Refuge. Since 2008, he's contributed to research on the American pica with Dr. Eric Beaver and started serving as a scientist for the Oregon Zoo's Pika Watch Citizen Science Program in 2017. And I know a lot of you are really interested in that program, so um, we do have some information that we can share at the end of this presentation, because I know a lot of folks are um, trying to understand where that's at. So don't worry, we've set plenty of time at the end to go through all of that. And then I um, just wanted to go through, here we go. Um, so before I hand it off to Stephen, I wanted to talk a little bit about friends and how we're all here. For anyone who has um, been invited to this webinar by a friend or are still getting to know who we are. Friends of the Columbia Gorge is the only conservation organization entirely dedicated to protecting, preserving, and stewarding the Columbia Gorge for future generations. Friends led the fight to protect the gorge by helping create the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area for over, excuse me, over 40 years ago. And it's been working ever since to safeguard the gorge and make sure the natural wonders found today will be preserved for generations to come. Friends is entirely dedicated to protecting and preserve, excuse me, and enhancing the scenic, natural, natural, and recreational resources of the Columbia Gorge. In celebration of International Biodiversity Day and Friends' 40th year anniversary, ensuring the gorge remains a vibrant, living place for both people and species, such as the American pika, we produce gorgeous wildlife. Um, because many of us can't access the outdoors as easily right now, we wanted to bring the outdoors to you with some amazing wildlife that lives right here in the gorge. On May 20th, we'll explore native bees in the gorge with Friends' Land Trust Associate, Francis Fisher, and U.S. Wildlife, or excuse me, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Regional Wildlife Biologist, Joe Engler. On May 28th, we'll talk about the West Coast's only native freshwater turtle, the Western Pond, who lives in the gorge. Shelly Petit from the Oregon Zoo and Friends' Land Trust Stewardship Coordinator, Sarah Woods, will explore the native Western Pond and how several state agencies and organizations are collaborating together with Friends to restore the population in the gorge. With that, I'm uh, going to stop sharing my screen here so Stephen can share his. There we go. And um, hand it off to Stephen and um, of course, Stephen Clark is here to talk to us about the unique and unusual pika population we have living in the gorge. And Stephen, have you seen my um, screen share stop and you should be able to share yours? It just now stopped. I think I'm awesome. able to do it now. Well, excuse me just a second. I'm just trying to get things uh, set up and then I should be able to go. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I want to uh, remind you that if you have a question while I'm going on and while I'm talking, um, if you have a question you wanna write it down or something like that, then uh, Natasha will forward it to me. I love one thing uh, that she was saying in her opening remarks about what the what the friends of the gorge do and I love seeing those pictures the pictures of the bee and the pond turtle and it reminds me of something I saw in the paper just last week from David Sibley he's the guy who illustrates uh, I think I have a copy right here this is the David Sibley's bird guide so he wrote this uh, article and he said suppose you want to start uh, seeing birds and how do you get started if you know nothing and one of the first thing he said is when you go outside notice things. And I wonder how many times I've walked past pikas 
and I never even noticed him. Before uh, you all were here, a woman named Dula said, or no, maybe it was uh, just before her, someone piped in just to give a little ee, which is the sound the pike is made. But even that, a lot of people, when they're walking on a trail, they, uh, they think it's a bird. I think whatever it is you've got outside, you have to stop and notice it. And if you are an older person who walks slow, hallelujah, there's more chance you're going to see something or hear something. Everyone should maybe take a time to, to walk a little bit slowly, and you might see something like this pica. Well, here's the pica, and for those of you who like a little bit of biology, it's called Ochotona princeps. The Ochotona comes from a word from Tibet, and this is an unusual animal because if you imagine the world as a globe, of course, and if you were to put frosting on it and it would dribble down the sides, there are some animals that spread through the globe by what they call polo arctic um, spreading. It's almost like they evolutionarily they stopped at the, started at the very top of the earth and then they just sort of dripped down like frosting wherever they could and so they dripped all the way down to Tibet and in Russia and in all these northern countries and they dripped also down uh, into Canada and the United States. And so here we have Ochotona, that's the genus, Princeps which is Little Prince. And the subspecies that we'll see in the Cascades of Washington, Oregon is Fenisix. But um, we call him the American pica. And take a look at that little guy. Um, if, if we were in person, I would ask how many uh, have seen these. And I bet, uh, oh, I bet one out of every 50 people in a talk like this would raise their hand. But um, if, we had some magic way of knowing who has heard one, even if you didn't know it. I bet twice that number of people would have had the, the hands go up. They're out there oh, in the gorge and you don't often see them. So a lot of people say, oh, what a cute little guy. It's a, it's a, I just love that kind of rodent. It's not a rodent and we'll get to that in a second. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to share a little bit of natural history. Natural history, it doesn't really mean history at all. In biology, natural history means how they live what they do, what they, the kind of questions like, if you were to sit down with a pike and say, so where do you live? What do you do? What do you eat? Have any boyfriends, girlfriends? That kind of question, that's natural history. And they really should not be in the gorge. It's a surprise to mammologists that they live in the gorge because the gorge is, the elevation is far too low. So we'll talk about that too. And of course, then, uh, if you, I imagine there probably isn't a more concentrated group of people who were traumatized by the Eagle Creek fire than those who are uh, friends of the gorge because it's like watching something that you really love just burn up. It was, it was very difficult to watch. We'll talk about reproduction because they did survive the fire and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then climate change uh, is kind of how we'll end it. So let's get started. It is not a rodent. It is what they call a LIGO. Morph. Morph means shape, so it means LIGO shaped. And I'm going to lean in on the camera so that you can see this. If you put your tongue behind your front teeth, and if you feel any teeth there behind your front teeth, like these right here, then you too might be pretty fast and a good jumper. Because one thing that characterizes rabbits is right behind their front teeth, there are two more teeth right behind it. And no orthodontist is gonna move those around. They're supposed to be there. So these are an unusual, it's not a rodent and it's not even a rabbit. It's more of a hare. So here's a wonderful picture. And now can you see how it does look a little bit like a rabbit? It does have a long back foot and it does have big ears, but not that big. In fact, even its uh, back legs aren't that long and where's the tail? There's something in biology called uh, Allen's rule. And that is, I'll talk about it more later, but if you live in a very cold area and you're very long limbed, then all your limbs run the risk of getting frostbite. So evolutionarily, if you're in a very cold area over millions of years, your limbs will retreat. Think of the Arctic fox, it's short legged, short ears. And here's a rabbit, a hare with very short ears. They still are characteristically large, but not as large as their brethren. And where's the tail? Yeah, they have a tailbone, but then so do you and I. So first of all, it's a lagomorph. 
not a rodent, it's a member of the rabbit family. Lago is hair, so hair shaped. And Steven, we have a question. Oh, please. Yeah, okay, real quick. Um, it looks like Rick, you raised your hand first. Go ahead What's and up? unmute, and we can hear you if you unmute. Hi, Rick. Unmute and tell me your question. Are you there, Rick? There's a chance, Rick, you're asking a question, text. but the mute button is not uh, clicked. So you want to look for a little microphone that has an X through it, touch it, and then we should hear you. Natasha, he answered in text. It sounds like he's just listening now. Okay, I'm sorry. Never mind. Okay. And then we have one more from John. Let's see if, um, John, are you here with us? John also answered in text. Uh, he right. said he was just raising his hand that he had seen a pika. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, oh, you, oh good for you. So you guys have seen pikas. Great. So back to the lagomorph. Here's something that's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the characteristics, and this is a biologists often do this kind of characterization of lagomorphs. They'll um, they'll talk about whether they're altricial or precocial. So here are rabbits, and when they're born, they're uh, no fur. And if uh, hares, they're born with fur, their eyes open earlier, their ears open earlier. A, a horse is a great example of a animal that has, is altricial, excuse me, precocial. They're born, they stand up and they can walk before too long. Um, Ryan, I need your help a little bit. I lost uh, the view of Natasha. Uh oh, can you still see me? No, I can't. Um, you might have just uh, turned her camera off, but um, if you can still see your presentation, I would say just keep going. I can see my presentation. So uh, these are lagomorphs, and those are a couple characteristics of, of lagomorphs. Where do pika live? Uh, pika live typically, and they're adapted for alpine habitat, high elevation. So this picture right here is typical of where you'd see pika. Most people who see pika, they'll see it when they're up at Timberline in, uh, at Mount Hood or they're on the Paradise Trail at Mount Rainier. You'll see it way up high. And also there's another thing, uh, pika are what we call talus obligates. When you say the word obligate, that means they don't like to live in that spot. They have to, they're obligated to. And talus means rock slide. So here's, if, if you were up at this elevation in the mountains, you're starting to have fewer and fewer trees and the trees you do have are skinny and you see these big fields of rock, you say, hey, I might be in pika territory. That's typical. And you might say, well, it's awful cold up there. Yes, it is, they're adapted for that. They can manage it. But look at this, so different. Here's the Columbia River Gorge. And if I were just walking along in the Columbia River Gorge and I saw this particular scene, I see all kinds of rocks. I see a certain amount of shade in the background that tells me it's not gonna be baked hot. And I also see all this moss. If I saw that and it was the right time of day, I would say, I have a feeling we might have pika here. So I work with Eric Beaver. He's at the US Geological Service and he's probably the premier uh, Pika researcher in the United States. He calls the Columbia Gorge a Goldilocks piece of habitat. So if you imagine that pika only live at tree line, timber line, then what in the world are they doing way down here? In the Columbia River Gorge, pika are at the lowest elevation in North America, the lowest elevation. And he says the Goldilocks idea is the reason they can live down here in the gorge is the couple things are just right. Number one, there's talus all over the place. Think of all the cliffs. Every time there's a cliff, there's going to be rock fall in the, in the springtime when uh, freeze causes rocks to fall down. And then you have, you have rocks at the foot of all these cliffs. There's rocks in the background right here. And wherever you have those rocks, I could have potential habitat. Second thing, look how deep the rocks are. If the, what, what pika do is they go in the rocks and then they go deeper and deeper until <laughs> you can hardly see me, but then uh, it gets cooler and cooler. It's like being in the cellar. 
So here we have the Columbia River Gorge with several miles of cliffs on the north and south side of the river, each one bleeding off rocks every year. And the pika go down in there and down in that deep rock, they have cold temperatures that are like a refrigerator, very similar to being at Timberline. They also, on the Oregon side especially, the cliffs are facing the north. So most of the day they're in shade. And one thing that pika are really sensitive to, uh, weasels, they're sensitive to weasels. Weasels can chase them very readily, but they're sensitive to warm temperatures. In fact, um, it, research seems to indicate that if they are at 78 degrees, what we would barely call warm, they start to suffer heat stress. And in fact, if they did not have these south facing deep um, callus with plenty of rainfall, I might add, uh, they probably would not live here. It would be just too warm. Shady cliffs. If I look at that right there, I think if I got in close where all these trees are down at the bottom, chances are I'm gonna find a pile of rocks and it's so shady and so moist, I think there'd be a good chance there'd be a pika there. It is very unusual to see pika at this low elevation, but they're so pronounced down here that Eric Beaver, uh, the research I helped him with, we don't even look for pika if they're uh, more than 3,000 feet up. We only look for the lowest of the low, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So these guys are a wonder. They are, it's a, it's a marvel that this little animal can survive in their native habitat. By that, I mean up in the alpine. They're adapted for that real cold weather. And let me tell you why that's so unusual from a biology point of view. I know he looks perfect, but he is perfectly adapted. So here are some animals that uh, are winter animals. I'm gonna give you a minute, don't yell it out and scare your family, but do you know what this guy is? It's a varied thrush. The varied thrush is adapted for the winter. However, when it gets real cold, they'll fly south. Not all of them, but most of them will fly south. And sometimes we'll have these birds in the winter, and those are birds from Canada that flew down to our area. So here's a bird that's not too dissimilar from the pika in size. It doesn't hang around for the winter. Here's the elk. What they'll do, elk in the summertime, they go uphill. In the wintertime, they go downhill. They manage what temperature they're exposed to by their elevation. Here's what we call, this is a hard one. I'm gonna pause for a second while you guys see if you can identify that. It's uh, bigger than a cat. This is a, a marmot, the hoary marmot that lives in the Cascades. These guys are, here's what they do in winter. They don't travel. They can't fly like a bird. They hibernate. And when I say hibernate, I mean that their temperature drops so low that if you were to grab them and shake them, they would not wake up. Their temperature is so low that uh, they're in a coma. And they end up burning so few calories that it doesn't bother them that they can't eat for weeks and weeks and weeks because their meta metabolic rate is just barely moving. Here's another winter animal. This is a wolverine. Now the wolverine does not hibernate, nor does it leave the area, but it's a bigger animal than a pika. It has what we call favorable body to mass ratio. The bigger you are, the more you're going to be able to retain your temperature. Think about adults, if you're out on a walk on a cold day with a child, who's gonna get first, cold first? The children always do, because they have more surface area. So compared to a pika, this guy is sitting pretty. This guy will eat anything, it can, anything. I should just stop right there. It, it, it travels like crazy, it goes uphill, it goes downhill. That would be a wonderful topic, uh, the wolverine. But uh, they manage winter by being a bit bigger. They have wonderful fur and they eat anything. And now we have this little guy. This guy does not move south for the winter. It does not go downhill. It does not hibernate and that is a marvel. When you have an animal that small, they don't hibernate. So how do they manage their natural, by that I mean high elevation uh, habitat? 
Well, this is one of the reasons that the pika, they were voted the second cutest mammal on the planet. The first was someone had flooded the voting with uh, pictures of baby polar bears. Polar bears won. Pikas got second, but look what, here's why they get second. They don't hibernate. And if they don't hibernate, they live in rocks and snow. What do they do? They have to store all kinds of food. They're like a squirrel and that they, they cache food. They are what some people call haymakers. So it's very easy in the summer to find a picture of a pika and we say, oh, look at how cute you are. We think they're cute. I saw them working on Mount Adams one time. They're frantic to gather enough vegetation. They'll lay it on the rocks. They'll let it dry, like, just like hay. And instead of bringing it up to a barn, they bring it down to the rocks. And they end up with these giant hay piles, as big as a beach ball, stuffed in the crevices where they live. And consequently, this little animal can survive the winter, food-wise, it stores its own food. How does it manage just the temperature? They are a cool file. They like the cold temperatures. As I said, they'll die if uh, they're over 78 degrees. But look at that fur. This is, uh, it's wonderfully dense. And what you're seeing with the brown and the black is you're seeing the brown is what we call the kind of the top coat and the, uh, the gray is the undercoat. It's very downy and it's very thick. And they have wonderful fur. They have some behaviors as well. When they're cold, they will become like a ball. They're minimizing their surface area. And then if it becomes warm, they're gonna go, oh my gosh, here, I gotta get some of this extra heat out. I can't stand other, it's, what is it? 74 degrees, whew. And so they'll stretch out like this, they'll lie out on the rocks and try and cool down. So these guys, they really are, they're a marvel because they're at the edge. When you think of a smaller, warm-blooded animal, like um, a hummingbird, a hummingbird, when it gets real cold at night, they go into torpor, which is like a mini hibernation. These guys don't. So they are very unusual. And all those adaptations were crafted by thousands of years of fine tuning evolutionarily. And now they're all set and they can live up at uh, five, 6,000 feet elevation. And then we find them in the Columbia Gorge, lowest elevation ever. The reason that we first started uh, studying them down here is because if we're interested in studying an animal for climate change, where do you think you're going to notice the first die-off? Now, I, it's unpleasant to think about it, but if you want to, if you can't measure it, you can't uh, manage it. So if, if you want to find out if an animal's in trouble, don't go to their best habitat. They'll survive in their best habitat for years. Go to the edge. Go to where they're on a knife's edge of survival. Where would that be? At this ridiculously low elevation in the gorge. So the gorge is a wonderful spot to take a look at which population might be the first one to respond to their environment becoming inhospitable due to temperature. So they're wonderfully adapted, but here we are in the gorge. You gotta admit, even so, even, the, even though it's Goldilocks, we're at the edge of what they can manage. So why do they live here? This is something that was uh, a surprise for researchers, and this was discovered uh, in the last 10 years. Of course, they live in talus. Talus, again, means rocks. That's their, uh, they're obligated for that. Uh, they, if you ever see a pika that's not in talus, it's on its way to talus. But what uh, Johanna Barner, and uh, originally it was uh, her uh, doctorate advisor, Deering is her last name. Uh, they did some research in the gorge and they found out that pika eat moss. And that is, you know, if, you, if you're not thinking of biology, you think, oh, moss, animals graze, that makes sense. But moss is like celery. It, it, it doesn't have a lot to offer. And typically, um, if someone were to propose to a biologist, well, this animal gets by on eating moss, we would say, well, they must have a very low metabolic rate. Well, that's not the case with a warm-blooded animal. They've got a high rate. Uh, but 
Joanna Barner and Deering, they found out that, yeah, they do. They eat moss. It's a big deal. Well, as soon as that occurred, by the way, you have to love this picture. This was taken by a Cascade Pika Watch volunteer who lives here in the Gorge, Linda Steiger. Um, and she has some wonderful pictures. I'll just give her a little shout out. She's got, uh, she's, I think she's an artist of great talent. And uh, she has a lot of beautiful things uh, on her website that you could purchase. But uh, so here's this uh, pica. And what I love about this picture is it's got moss all over the place. And what uh, Johanna Barner found out, there's Johanna Barner on the right. That's a pica on the left. You can barely see them. But they were finding out that the mo moss was not just food, which is a wonderful contribution, but they also got interested in the insulation effect. When I was a kid, it always amazed me that you could, one could build an igloo and be warm inside or warmer. Uh, the snow will insulate. Yes, the snow is cold, but it insulates you from even colder things. And when you have snow piled on top of rocks, think of the Timberline area, then the rocks will be sheltered a little bit from extreme low temperatures. And Bo Joanna Barner found out that this moss contributes to their food and it uh, probably acts as an insulation as well. So when my group, Eric, uh, I'm helping Eric Beaver, when we are out, as soon as uh, Johanna Barner said moss is a big deal, it, every summer after that, we started measuring how thick the moss was, one of our important data points. You go out to a patch as a field biologist, count how many pikas were there, can you get an idea of what vegetation was there, and then how thick is the moss? So moss is a big deal. If you ask the question, how can pika live in the gorge? Well, we've got unusual talus, lots of shade, lots of rain, and lots of moss. And that's something they don't have uh, so much at the, at the top of the, their habitat up by Timberline. I just let you enjoy that picture for a second. It's like living in an orchard. So moss is a wonderful player. When I'm walking on the trail, any trail in the gorge, and I go by rocks, a talus, if it's shady, if the rocks are fairly big, meaning as big as a cantaloupe or bigger, then I'm kind of mildly interested in if pikas are there. But if there are big rocks and it's shady and there's moss, now I'm listening. By the way, I say I'm listening. Nine times out of the 10, out of 10 when I identify pika, it's because I hear them. I hear them far more often than see them. I'm gonna pause for a second to remind you that um, if you have a question, if we were in a regular audience, I would tell you, raise your hand, let me know. And don't worry about the pace. If it, if it takes us off, I'll, I'll keep going. Or if I'm gonna cover it later, I'll tell you. But- uh, we, we do have one question. Press it. They just came up. Okay, great. Thank you folks for writing questions. What do you have for me? So it looks like um, John is first. John, go ahead and unmute. I think John might have just never put his hand down. So I think okay. it's Alexandria. Same, John. Thank you, Ryan. Let's see here. We've got Alexandria. I'm allowing you to talk right now. You should be able to unmute. So Alexandria, we can't hear you right now, but there should be a microphone icon with a bar through it. If you could touch that, it will free up your microphone. It's a little red icon. There you go. There you go. Thank you. What's your question, Alexandria? You want to ask it, Alexandria? Um, how uh -oh. are they born? How are they born? Alexandria, um, let me think if you, what you have that is similar there i'm going to sh i'm going to show a picture later on about how they're born uh and they're born in march so right now the the pikas out in the gorge they they're born in a very dark fairly cool probably feels a little bit like a refrigerator for you and me the mother is going to have babies and she'll have two or three babies, not very many. I mean, think of a dog. A dog will have six, seven. These, uh, the females will have two. If it's a first year mother, meaning she's one year old, she'll have only two. So she's got two babies down there. 
They grow awfully fast for, uh, for the size that they are. They were born in March, and now in May, the babies are already out on the rocks. And they'll go up onto the rocks and come back down. They were weaned a couple of weeks ago, meaning they're not drinking milk from mother anymore. So that's a little bit of how the, the babies are born, Alexandria. And then we got a few more questions. If I try to run through them kind of quick, Stephen. Um, how are gorge pica related to those we see at Mount Rainier or Mount Baker? So the question is, how are they related to those that we have in Mount Rainier or Baker? Mm -hmm. the, the short answer is, and the biological answer is, if an animal is connected, meaning if, if an animal in the gorge at elevation 100 feet can mate with another one that moves up to 500 feet, and maybe a year later it'll move up to one that's 1,000 feet. And then you ask yourself, in 100 years, which would be about 30 generations of pika, could the one at 100 feet end up being somewhat related to somebody on Mount Hood? Yes. Consequently, we say their DNA is connected. If you took the DNA of, of, of pika in the gorge, they are very similar to the, all the other um, pikas from Mount Baker all the way down to uh, Central Oregon. And then one more quick question. When were pika first discovered in the gorge? I, that's a funny question, when were they first discovered? My guess is that the America, Native Americans knew they were there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've read about uh, some old books about mammals in Oregon in the 1930s where people actually documented them. But um, I think as soon as people uh, did hiking uh, and hunting, they probably ran into uh, gorge pika. What happens that's kind of significant for us now is in the last 20 years, people like Eric Bieber and others actually documented it and then put it in a scientific journal so other people could look at it and say, wow, that is unusual, the, the low elevation they have. I think I'm gonna move on, Natasha. Yeah, I'm gonna say we're gonna move on. Sorry, folks, we see your questions in the chat, but for the sake of time, we're gonna move on, but don't worry, plenty of time at the end. Go okay, ahead. so moss is a big deal. And one thing that we were trying to do with Eric Beaver, we've done several things. I say we, but I want to make it clear I'm his uh, field assistant, but wanted to figure out where the edges are. Where do pika live? And it turns out on the Oregon side, they stretch from Corbett to a little bit past Hood River. And take a look at this. On the Washington side, they don't have as broad a range. Our hypothesis is that the sun is shining on the Washington side more than the shady Oregon side, and the Washington side is the, the habitat isn't as wonderful for the pikas. Here's an example of this. This is uh, Cape Horn, Washington, very close to Washul. And look at that rocks, shade, moss. It looks ideal. We have never seen a pika, never seen any of their scat. So this is. Uh, and, and about five miles away are the first pika. So this looks to, a biologist would look at this and say, hey, you might have found the very edge of, this is just too far away, too warm, too exposed. But if you go five miles to the east, it seems to work. And from a biological point of view, it's fascinating to find the nice edge where a population can finally survive. So here's the Eagle Creek fire. That is uh, the last switchbacks on Angel's Rest. And one of the things that Cascade Pika Watch by the Oregon Zoo did was they wanted to go in after the fire in 2017, wanted to go in and see what the survival was. That fire burned through the best patches of pika habitat that we had, that we uh, were aware of. And you know, what's their survival like? Here's some of the things that we found out. This is one of the patches uh, along Gorge Trail 400. We're looking uphill. And by the way, you look at that, and that looks lovely for pika. Big rocks, almost at this angle, it looks like 90% coverage of moss, uh, shade on the outside, it looks great. That's pre-fire, there's post-fire. 
So all the work that Johanna did that said moss is so important and look at the moss is gone. And moss does not grow back quickly. Moss doesn't even have roots. It's a, it's a very primitive plant, it grows slowly. So we were trying to investigate what happened. What you're seeing there in Johanna's hand is a temperature sensor and the arrow points to where it was. We had several temperatures in that, uh, temperature sensors in that patch and these would record temperatures while we're away. And here's what the temperature was prior to the fire breaking out. Somewhere around five degrees Celsius. That's about 42 degrees. That's close to what your temperature in your refrigerator is. Refrigerator temperatures is 39, 40, 41, 42. That's the temperature in the refrigerator. And then when we had the, the temperature sensors that are down in the rock, what we do is we hook them to a wire we move a couple rocks and we try and thread them down about a meter, about three feet, and let them sit. Here's the temperature of the underground or under rock. It went up, but it didn't go up much. It's still 45 degrees under those rocks. So that tells you that the pica could survive the fire. The they wouldn't be they wouldn't be killed by the temperature itself. They might be killed by the lack of oxygen. But it, it's amazing what a beautiful refuge that talus could be. So we had reason to believe that some of the pica could survive the fire. That was the hypothesis. But a hypothesis isn't anything if you can't go out and check it. That tells you that the surface temperature was high enough to melt plastic, so hundreds of degrees. Before the fire came, we were going at a certain, we, we selected uh, for, for comparison, a certain number of talus patches. And of these talus patches, 84% pre-fire had picas living in them. Afterwards, 38% of those uh, did no, no longer hosted the pica. So the fire seems to have, if, if these are 10 picas, it, it looks like 40% of them went away for the fire. I wish we could have done the research right after, while the, while the rocks were still warm, because my suspicion is that the pica, and, and if you are, I know some of my students are listening to this lecture, and from a biology point of view, it's kind of fascinating. As sad as it is, when did the pica probably die? They probably died when most animals die in the winter, not in the fire of September and late August. They probably died in January. That's just my opinion. What happened in, was in December, uh, their food supply was damaged. They can't go out and eat any moss and they probably starved to death. That, that would be my guess, but we weren't allowed to go check that. So we, we don't really know. Uh, it, would, it would have been fascinating to check that out. When you think about the pikas, uh, you know, losing, in our sample, 40% of their hab, uh, sites were the population was gone. How do they recover from that? And that segues beautifully into reproduction. So here we have a baby pica on the right. A little bit hard to distinguish a baby from uh, an adult. They're all small, but Alexandra asked about that. The, as I mentioned uh, to her question, pikas will have two or three babies per year. That is a very low number for a rabbit. When you think of rabbits, you think eight, nine, 10, and that's if they only have one clutch. If you are an animal and you only have two babies, a couple of interesting things. Well, let me, I, I sometimes tell my students this, if you're born and you look to your right and your left and you see all your, your siblings and there are like 15 of them, you say, uh-oh, why would we have 15 babies? we must mostly die. So pikas, they only have two, that means their survival ship for a small animal is pretty high. Mice will have 12 in a year, pika, two or three. So the pika will be born, and if you think back to that picture I showed uh, looking uphill in that wonderful talus patch, that talus patch might have only held three pikas. And the reason for that is pikas are territorial. I know it's a frightening picture here, but uh, pikas, they will, they have little pika wars. 
They will, if someone scampers over one pika's sections of rock, they'll challenge them. They'll have a little fight. They'll try and steal the hay from one another. So they are intolerant. In fact, they are only tolerant of other pikas when they mate or when they have babies. And very soon after that, they start, they'll pester the babies until the best babies say, oh, I can't stand this, it's too stressful. And that leads to dispersal. And dispersal is the term we use in biology, meaning a baby is gonna leave its natal area where it was born and go find another spot. They don't go far. They go at the, they probably only go a couple hundred meters. 30% of the pika in one area are going to die in any given year. So I might be born and I'll get a little pika fight over here. So I'll retreat and the pika that used to live here, pika Joe, is gone, weasel. And so I'll take that spot. So wherever you can find a spot, you can stay. Females and males will leave, but they don't go very far. When I say not very far, a couple hundred meters, maybe up to two or three kilometers, but that's a little bit unusual. So they don't go far. So after the fire, if there's a talus patch that's just scorched, those pikas, even the ones that used to live there, the ones that survived, they might have to go to another spot. They, they, would, they would leave it thinking, uh, I don't have enough food. So that would happen. Of course, that's a good thing too. That means after a fire, there's a bad patch, maybe only one pika stays there. It used to hold three, but now three can't survive. There's not enough food. So one stays, the others leave, and they colonize one where the pika died out. That is a natural phenomenon of dispersing and recolonizing territory. So what I'm trying to show in this picture is there's a baby pika and that pika might journey across that talus patch and it might go into the woods on the far side and just sort of blindly walk and listen for water and then big gorge being what it is, chances are before too long, they're gonna find another talus patch. And unfortunately, mortality is high when you disperse. You, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, you don't know where the predators are, and you don't have your comfortable refuge of rocks. So mortality is high, but they do creep back out. I always, uh, there's a kind of a fun run I do near the Skamania Lodge. There's some uh, dirt roads uh, on power lines back, uh, behind the lodge, and I'm running on those year after year. And, I had never seen pikas in the rocks. And then about three years ago, for the first time I saw them and they've been there for two or three years. Pikas have that capability of kind of colonizing and then they might die out and you might find a patch that isn't, doesn't have pika for several years, but they'll come back. So uh, I don't look at anything as permanent with pikas. Maybe the very best big patches, yes, but the smaller ones, they might come and go. So why are we thinking about pikas with climate change? The obvious answer is, as I mentioned, if they can't survive over 78 degrees, they're gonna be vulnerable, that's true. Let me show you something else. This is what people think about when they worry about, and this reminds me of the gentleman's question about the relationship of pikas from uh, Mount Baker, for example, and Mount Rainier. So let's say you've got pikas living at their typical spot, which is high elevation. They would go down the hill, and move up and they'd mate and you've got genetic diversity because the genes were shared. So this would go up a little hill, mate, come back, and it could happen over several generations. And they've got all that habitat, all that green area is, I'm gonna get my pointer out. All this green area is good habitat for them. But what if climate change comes up and causes that temperature to go up so they, they don't have good temperature uh, at low elevations anymore. Now let's see what happens. This pika goes down, yikes, I can't go to the next hill because I've run out of good habitat. This pika goes down, yikes. And what happens is you get genetic isolation and you get inbreeding. And inbreeding and lack of genetic diversity is one mechanism of die off. So people are concerned about pikas because if animals are at high elevation and it gets warmer, where can they go? They're stuck. And the other thing, what we worry about here in the gorge is the Hood River temperatures are gonna get warmer and warmer and maybe we won't see them and they'll die out. This is an interesting picture that I 
I share. I was thinking the other day of, of people who are my generation. You remember a singer named Johnny Cash. And Johnny Cash used to always perform in black. And he said, one of the reasons I perform in black is because I want people to always remember the downtrodden. So he kind of had a mission to speak for people. And I can't give a talk on any animal that I love, and trust me, there are many, and not bring up human population. Because ultimately, any person who's concerned about conservation has to recognize that if human population goes up, we have to do it by taking resources from other animals. We can't have an equilibrium. We've got we've to be taking it for ourselves. So I would love to tell all you people who are, all you women who are over 60, please don't have any more children. But what I like to tell my students is think about how big you, you want your family to be. Because uh, if you have a small family, you sure do take some pressure off the pikas. And they will thank you for it. That's it, my friends. And uh, Natasha, you can help me with uh, questions and answers. Yes, we have quite a few. And um, thanks, everyone, for being so patient. Ruth, Marcy, Jean, Sarah, I got all your guys' questions. Um, we're going to get to them now. So first and foremost, in the salad slide, this is from Cindy, what species is the dark green moss? Um, I don't know what it was, but there is a chance it was a hornwort. Okay. I, I noticed, too, it looked pretty stringy. And, and so it might have been a, a moss or what they say when they don't really know what the title is, which is me, a moss or a moss ally. Yeah, I, I don't know what that one is. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if people in the audience do because it's a common one. I've seen it, but I don't know what it is. No worries. Kathy wants to know um, their lifespan. How, how long do they usually live? Oh, what a great question about lifespan. Uh, I like answering that question because there are two ways to look at lifespan. One is if the animal were in your house like a pet, like a dog, how long would it live? You could, you know, how long can dogs live? Well, dogs can live to be 16 years old. Let's take a real closely related canine, a coyote. How long do they live on average in the wild? That means the puppies, everybody. And it's going to be four years, five years. Pikas, um, if you go on a talus and you survey all the pike and ask them how old they are, the oldest one is going to be four or five years old. That would be typical. But if they were raised in the zoo, you know, like if someone found one with a, you know, broken leg and it couldn't do anything and they, you know, took it to the zoo, maybe it would live for six or seven years. But it, it would be very typical. Of course, if, if a female has two babies her first year of life and two babies in the second year of her life and two in her third, That's six babies, and that, that means the population of the pikas are going to go up, or most of those die. Mm -hmm. So the way it works in biology is by the time the female dies, if she's successful, successful she will have had two surviving babies. Mm -hmm. So most of them die, but I think it's reasonable to think maybe three years is a decent average. What else? All right. Um, from Alicia, would replanting moss be at all a possibility for recovering areas? It would be, but I have a feeling that uh, the natural proce process of moss recolonization is going to be much better than what humans could do. I would consider replanting if it were a rare plant and something that you couldn't find the seeds or the spores. But moss will have spores. One thing about moss that is interesting, but not on this topic, is the moss, um, the sperm of moss, they, they get splashed out by a raindrop and they kind of go wherever that raindrop goes. So they don't go very far. So I suppose if you were really trying to encourage moss, you would put little patches of moss, that way the rain wouldn't have to go so far. But I'm pretty sure they're going to recover on their own. And in some ways, hard as it was to watch, that fire was a pretty natural fire, meaning it would burn some places like that slide I showed of Eagle uh, of Angel's Rest. But then 200 meters away from that, you'll have a, a nice green patch that survived. I think it's going to be all right. It would be my, my thinking on that. 
Alrighty. Um, for let's go with uh, we answered that question. For Marcy, do the male and female stay together with the young, or is the female a loner in raising them? Um, the female is a loner. However, um, neither one of them really stay with them. These are an interesting animal. They don't, they don't nuzzle. They don't sit side by side. Uh, they, uh, they're characterized by animosity. So, uh, and, and that's true of a lot of animals that have to protect the territory. So the male and female, they will mate. And then right after mating, they'll say, get out of here. I never really did like you anyway. And then she'll have her uh, two or three kits and female mammals will have oxytocin. It's a hormone that is produced when babies are around and it makes them care for them and love them. But as soon as the, I shouldn't say love them, care for them. And as soon as the, the mother stops uh, nursing, which in this case for 30 days, that goes away. So mom is attentive and watching out and careful for 30 days. And after that, find your own talents. And then next question. Sarah, what are the main predators of pika? Since the pika can't fight back and they're small and they are good food to eat, they will, anything that can catch them will catch them. However, if you look at, they're a little bit like the beaver. Beaver is a lovely morsel for a lot of animals and it's not fast, you can easily catch it, except you have to swim out in the water and then go under the water to get into it. So the pika, has a wonderful refuge in rocks and a coyote can't follow it into rocks. Uh, a bobcat can't follow it. They will get killed opportunistically, meaning if one doesn't see it and if an eagle or a, more likely a hawk would come down and get it, they could get caught. Probably their most effective predator is a weasel. In fact, pikas do this. They go, ee! And that's what we do when we survey. We go out in rocks and we listen for ee! And as soon as we hear it, we count. There's one, eee! there's another one way over there. And it's a warning call. There some pikas, is there somebody on the rocks? It's not one of us, it's a human. Eee! And if they see a weasel, here's what they do. They just dive down into the rocks and say, good luck, my friends, because weasels will go fast under the rocks and kill them. I was on a talus patch on the Washington side doing a survey and I saw a weasel. It was fascinating and grim at the same time. From Jim, what would be the impact if the pika died out? What would be the ripple effect? Sometime, I one time did a talk where I, I took a bicycle and I put a bicycle up on stage and I said, this bicycle works, but if I had to take a, a piece off of it, what piece would I take off? And I'm thinking of ecology. If you've got a working ecological spot, the gorge, and you say, well, I'm gonna go ahead and damage some, something. So I'm gonna let the pika go and you pull off the handlebar grip. And then you say, I'm gonna let this moth get extirped from this area. And you take another part of the bike off. You can still ride it. And then you take another part off. And maybe you raise the temperature of the water. And you could take the seat off. You could still ride it standing up. And, but after a while, if you take off enough parts, you've really wrecked that bike. I don't know exactly what the ripple effect is of the pika. And if someone could tell me for sure that the only animal that would die would be a pika, probably everything would survive. But whatever causes that pika to die is gonna cause other things to die too. So I worry about that. Now back to the real practical matter of your question. If the pika went out of the gorge, you've got the weasel that can, the weasel would survive, it would switch to a different predator. Um, it is possible that a human would not notice if the pikas went away. If you, were, if you were a mouse on the same spot where the pika lived, you'd say, wow, it's interesting. This moss is going crazy. It used to sort of be kept in check. I wonder what's happening. So that's the way I would approach it as a biologist, but that would be an interesting thing to study. Right. Moving along here um, from Sandra, is there any chance that the pika watch 
program will take place in any form this summer. Do we have any updates that we can give folks about that? We do have an update. The update is not likely. <laughs> um, I, I just, I contacted, Natasha asked me to check on that because she anticipated people would ask that question. And they're hopeful, of course, that would happen. And Eric Beaver is hoping to come out here. He works in Montana. He hopes to come out here in August. If you start looking for him in September, you, you're you really at the tail end of the season. They're active, but less active, a little bit like a cat. They're still there, but you can't find them. Uh, so we would love to have the volunteers. Some volunteers do it for a year and it's not for them. And if there's 500 people out there watching this and you think you might be interested, go to the zoo's website and they have, actually they have volunteers I happen to know, volunteer positions for both the Cascade Pike Watch and for the Western Pond Turtle. We aren't taking any new volunteers right now for Cascade Pike Watch because we're not, we're more likely not to be do, able to do any study this summer. And around the gorge from Robin, what is the best time of day to see a pika? Well, I want my students to cover their ears because um, I don't want them to be traumatized by this. But when I take students out to look for pika, we meet at the trailhead at six o'clock and I feel like <laughs> we've wasted an hour. Mm. Yeah, that AM. So these guys, like so many animals, think about when you hear the birds. You know, if you sleep with your windows open, which you should, open your windows and then it's like David Sibley said, notice something. So you have your windows open and then if you wake up at five in the morning, you won't be the only one up. Someone's up, someone's up and the pika are up too. And we're approaching the longest days of the year and the mothers are, the mothers right now are at their busiest time. Well, maybe a couple weeks ago they were at their busiest time because they're giving out tremendous amounts of calories in milk and they've got to get food so they're out. The best time would be as soon as you can easily see and be on that trail, which is now 6.30 in the morning if you get out at a pika patch. But we don't even do our surveys if it's uh, noon. If it's noon, we feel like they could be taking the siesta. We'll, we'll miss them. So for me, I would say 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think we're going to more, and then for the sake of time, we might have to go, but um, we got a few more to go through here. How far oh. east um, from Tamara, how far east are they found on the Washington side? Carson, very close to Carson. Oh, but by that, when you say that, I'm talking about the low elevation pika. If you go higher up in the hills, uh, you know, in the Cascades, you'll find them. But remember the research that I was helping with is we want to find pika at less than a thousand meters or 3,000 uh, 3, feet. So, um, excuse me, 1,000 feet, 1,000 feet, less than 1,000 feet. So um, it, they trickle out at Carson. And from Sydney, is there a size difference between males and females? If so, which one is usually bigger? No. I struggle just to make the difference between the, the babies. Um, they, they're all gonna be about the same size. Uh, they're, they're, to, be, to be fair, uh, there might be a difference, but very little research on pika has been where you actually take them and weigh them. Uh, and you certainly can't see it when you look at them. You know, just, it'd be like looking at two robins. They look like the same size. And Tara, um, just on that note, she asked, what are the babies called? Kits, K-I-T-S, or cute. By the way, these are wonderful questions, you guys. Uh, very nice. Yeah, I love too it. Bad, no, too bad no men are asking questions. <laughs> Cowards. Here we go. Cowards. <laughs> Cowards. Um, oh, maybe Natasha's only reading the female. No, no, no. I'm trying to go through all of them here. Um, sorry, from the top. Um, Rick wants to know about... I believe predation, would they not be affected by climate change or fires? And I know you kind of touched briefly on that towards the end of the presentation. What, what are you getting at, Rick? I'm not sure I understand. I think it made me the first question is just, um, are, are they affected by climate change fires, maybe? Um, well, here's what we're, the data so far, uh, until this last year, the data looked like the Columbia River Gorge was a pretty nice refuge 
and we did not, we didn't start seeing signs of them, uh, the range shrinking down. That's what you look for, the edges. You know, are they creeping in from Hood River and going farther and farther west? And then last year, and this is pre-analysis. So from a researcher's point of view, what you do is you gather data and when you're walking down the trail and the two biologists are talking and say, hey, doesn't it seem like it's uh, a little bit more this than it was last year? And that's our feeling, but we haven't analyzed all the numbers. But it did look like some of our sites that were out by Hood River, we struggled to find pica. I found one of them last year at a, at a place where there used to be maybe three or four. So it, this is not uh, research. This is a researcher thinking of his opinion. It looks like there might be a little bit of a uh, retraction on the east side in Oregon. And then Jean wants to know, do they have any extra skeletal adaptions for their extreme uh, contraction expansion? Um, good question. Um, I think what you mean is, do they have, what are some more ad adaptations they have for their, I would guess you're thinking for their temperature. It actually is a big deal that that is such a small rabbit and their limbs are shorter. And if you were to take that and put it next to a, a black-tailed jackrabbit and have the two of them, you know, have a conversation, you're a hare, I'm a hare, what happened to you? Alan's rule, I live in the mountains. That's why everything's small. So the adaptations I would say are that uh, it's a more compact body. Perfect. And then Audrey wants to know, where does the name pika come from? I don't know where the pika comes from. I know Ochitona is a Tibetan in its origin, but pika itself, I don't know. And of course, uh, pika is the common name. They're sometimes called rock conies or whistling conies or haymakers. Mm -hmm. There are a handful of them that make more sense. I don't know what a pika is, but don't, this isn't an animal that was discovered in America first. And it's not like the bison, uh, what we think of as the buffalo, that's only a North American animal. This is something that had been over many continents for thousands of years. And I don't really know where the name comes from. Fascinating though. According to Wikipedia, it oh. does come from uh, the, the Tungus, Tungus languages. Which are in which are in Siberia, which is one of the first areas the okay. was discovered. I assume. Thank yeah, you, I, yeah. So, so not just the um, the Latin Ochotona or the binomial, but also the common name Pika. Thank you very much, Ryan. And then Libby wants to know if they have any defense mechanisms or techniques. They are very effective by dropping down in the rock. So two, two, two techniques come to mind right away. One is ee! when they hear that, everyone's alert, all the pike in the area, they're looking around. And if anything seconds that warning, down they go. So they'll jump down in the rocks and almost, I mean, what predator can chase it down into the rock? Snakes aren't fast enough. I don't think they pursue them like that. That's not kind of, snakes kind of sit and wait. They usually aren't a chasing Weasel's the only one I can think of. So it, they've got a wonderful defense. When a beaver hears something, a tail slap on the water, poof, under it goes, they're safe. It's a pretty good defense. And then- uh, it, must be, it must be, they only have two babies. And then an anonymous attendee um, asking, do pikas in different areas have different or distinct calls? Um, depends on how far out you go. So this is actually um, an animal that has a lot of different species. So if you think of dogs, Canis, there's Canis latrans, that's the coyote, there's Canis lupus, that's the wolf. There are uh, several different species. Pikas worldwide have many species. And in fact, there's a particular colorful, I think it's called a collared pika in Asia. And my guess is, since they're different species, same group, but different species, my guess is that their calls are going to be distinctive, yes. Um, here we go. From Audrey, how long do you think the pika will take to recover to pre-fire population levels in the Columbia Gorge? Great question. If the, if the habitat weren't damaged, they would recover, I'm guessing, in three years, like now. But since the habitat hasn't recovered and the moss isn't all back there and some of the trees are still dead, 
and, and the, the food they eat isn't there, they're going to have, they can't go much faster than the moss. By the way, I just, I see Audrey had a question about how big they are. They're about as big as a baked potato. Thank you. Um, Alex Roberts is asking, what other animals share the talus with the pika if there are any? Well, um, I almost don't want to answer that because who asked that question? Alex. Alex. So I will answer it, but Alex, what would be so fun or so rich would be to go out to a place where you know there are pika, pack a lunch, be warm, sit and see what you see. And I would, you would answer that question better than me inside of two days. So as far as walking on the talus, not very many there. I always see uh, chipmunks out there in the same area and pikas as far as mammals go. But, but what if you start thinking about uh, insects uh, and, and snakes, garter snakes probably are out there. I bet it would be a wonderful thing to sit and, and watch, but I would actually want to, I would only want to be looking right, you know, in a circle, not much bigger than me. And I'd have a magnifying glass and I'd see, I'd see if I could count the different kinds of spiders. I know banana slugs are out there. It, it, it would be, that's a wonderful, that's a, I hope you're in charge of someone, Alex, because if you are, have them go do that. Um, Carl asks, how long are you planning on studying pika in the gorge? I'm 60. <laughs> I'm thinking 30 more years. <laughs> I, I, for me, it's a joy. Uh, there, it, it, it's uh, something I enjoy doing. Uh, I, I often go out. I often go out uh, at the end of the season. Cascade Pika Watch or Eric Beaver will say, you know, we got this data, but it doesn't seem any good. Or there's, there's two data sheets. We can't reconcile them. Could you go look at this one site one more time? And since you're out there, there's actually three others. So they'll send me out with a list of four. I'll get in my car, get a cup of coffee, a cinnamon roll, my dog, and I'll go out, park. No one's around. I go out there, walking along. I go to the first spot. I stay for 30 minutes. I count. I go to the second spot. Now you tell me, when am I going to stop doing that? I would love it if people would join me. Awesome. And then uh, Paula asked, one picture had a cone in needles or, or cone needles in the pika's mouth. Do pikas eat seeds from cones? If it has cal, I would say this, if they're gonna eat moss, which has low nutritional value, then they would love those other things, yes. Mm -hmm. They typically eat um, soft vegetation as opposed to a squirrel that will actually um, use their teeth to go through uh, like a filbert uh, case, uh, a nut. Um, but they'll eat a lot of things. One of the reasons that they lay their food, their vegetation out is because, you know, we think about animals and they're eating all these plants. Well, what about the plants? Plants feel like, sheesh, every time I start growing up, someone bites one of my leaves off. Plants start making compounds that make it so uh, they're unpalatable. Uh, tannins, it's a chemical. And so what happens is the, the rabbits, they come and eat it. And they come back the next day, hmm, it's a little more bitter. They come back the third day, hmm, it's getting more bitter every day. Well, the, the plant is like, I'm making more tannins trying to keep you guys off of me. And what, they'll, what the pika will do, they'll cut it, they'll lay it out in the sun, and the sun degrades the tannins, and it makes the hay more tasty. So they'll eat. Um, we think we know some of the foods they really like to eat. Um, I wish I, ocean spray. Uh, is a bush that they often eat, but they'll eat a lot of things. I would call them omnivore, omnivoric in their vegetation traits. I was just typing to everyone. Um, you have a few messages in the chat box of just great presentation. Professor Clark, thank you. This was fascinating. Um, oh. I've learned so much tonight. Thanks again. Great presentation. So awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're just going to go through a few more questions, but if you got to go, we get it. Well, let me, let me say this too, before people go, you know, there's something about a pika. It's, um, it's kind of, people talk about it as sort of a charismatic animal. Everybody can look at it and say, oh, how cute it is. 
Next week, uh, the next presentation is going to be on bees. And bees are arguably less cute. But even the bees, they've got the big fat bumblebees on the advertisement, which are the cutest of the bees. And what would be really neat is if you go outside, like Alex is going to do, and you sit in that little spot and you see a big old banana slug and you marvel at how smooth it is and how many spots it has. It would be neat if people would never say to their kill children, oh, that's gross, that's icky, or step on that. If they would say, what a marvel that is. Where do you think it's going? Does it, do I make it nervous? That's what I like. Pikas are an easy, easy sell. But go listen to the talk about the, uh, about the bumblebees. And then think about next time when you see a snail. It's fascinating. Those are beautifully wrought little critters right out there for us to look at. Awesome. We're going to go through a few more of these questions while we can. But again, thanks everyone saying great things, engaging and encouraging to observe and learn about. Um, see you out on the talus. See you out on the talus, Leslie. Um, hey They're early. <laughs> Um, Tara wants to know, do they forage during winter or do they just batten down the hatches and rely on their hair, their hay supply? Uh, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer because it's fairly unfruitful to look for them in the winter. So we don't. Um, here's my guess. My guess. And my guess is based on what other animals do. What, what an animal doesn't want to do is Think of yourself, you're out in the woods and you fall in the creek. Oh, jeez, you know, and, it, and it's winter time. That means you have to get all the way back to the car or whatever it is. They have the same sort of considerations. They don't want to get too wet. They don't want to get too cold. They're hungry. But if it's raining outside, it's worse to get outside and to get so wet, you have to come and try and warm up. There's no fire. So for them, it's always a balancing act. And they don't do it really cerebrally. They do it sort of instinctually, like, oh, that seems like it won't work. But if they have a bright day in January, out they go, get some fresh food and they eat it. So my guess is they batten down the hatches unless the temperatures are opportunistically wonderful on a certain day. Black bears in the uh, Washington, Oregon coast do that. They don't hibernate, but they'll lie down like a, like a cat all day, two days, three days, then they have a good day, out they go, gobble food up, then they'll go back. That's my guess. All right. Um, Roger, what does their territorial fighting consist of? Do they bite? Do they ever kill? I, it's funny to, I, I love answering this question two ways because I love science so much. I like to tell you that a scientist would say, We've not, we don't have any record that I'm aware of, and I've read a lot of stuff, that they've killed one another. But a scientist would say, it's possible, mm -hmm. it's unknown. Mm -hmm. So if you like science, there's that kind of careful, moderated, let's study it type of approach. Here's the other approach. My science perspective tells me that, once again, having a fight to the death is just like going out in the rain. Why would you? You're going to push, push, push. Oh, forget it. I'll go to my own spot. I imagine they're little kerfuffles. And then, by the way, like so many animals, they will avoid those fights. As soon as they have one fight, they'll say, okay, that's the territory, I get it. They'll smell it because they're marking all the time. They'll smell the urine to say, that's your area, okay. They, they get by by avoiding fights, not by winning fights. So my guess is it's a little bit of shoving, it's um, posturing, it's stealing, and then one of them says, this isn't worth it. That's probably what it is. Good question. Um, from Don, will a heavily human traffic trail have an impact on pikas? It has to, right? It has to. I live not too far from uh, the Steigerwald Natural Wildlife Refuge. And when they opened it up to people, they put a trail through it so people could go through it. And they said, you can't run. And I said, how come? I like to run because running is an unnatural movement and animals respond by, they, they respond with vision and their, the, the sense of an emergency. So a pike is out there eating moss and then a group of people start walking by, it has to impact them, right? Mm -hmm. I guess the question would be, does it impact them so much that they die from it? No, I don't think so. 
does it impact them? Yes, it does. If people were on that trail more and more, would they go farther and farther from the trail? Yes, they would. And then would they lose habitat? Yes, they would. And remember my last slide, you want one child. Um, we have from an anonymous attendee, their ears are large. Is this an advantage for dealing with heat or does this have something to do with their hearing? Wow, what a, I love both those hypotheses. I have no way to say either one of those hypotheses are poorly reasoned. I think having them for heat, you know, that will help them dissipate heat just like an elephant does. That's a real good point. If it's too big, that they're, then they run the risk of frostbite. So they might, they probably arrived at just the right size. And since they are vocal, um, you know, they care about hearing. Uh, moles don't care about hearing, they care about um, vibrations. So I think both of your hypotheses are good. I would have no way to rebut either of those. Well done. From Candace, how do the gorge pikas survive on a solely moss-based diet? Do they supplement with more nutritious food? Yes, they certainly do. In fact, um, that picture I showed early on uh, had them carrying all kinds of different uh, food supplies, and we see them eating. Once in a while, we'll find hay piles. When you go to high elevation, you'll find hay piles as big as a basketball in August. Down here in the gorge, they don't seem to have very big hay piles. It looks like an afterthought. And the hypothesis is they don't need it because they can eat all year. But don't misunderstand me and think that moss is their main food supply. It's a significant food supply and it doesn't die back in the winter. So it's a constant winter supply, whereas most of their other vegetation does die back in the winter. Would they die if they only had moss? They would become malnourished, just like you would if you only had one kind of vegetable. You'd become malnourished because the chemicals you need in your body aren't all in that plant. And if you don't have them in the plant, what are you going to do? You'll be malnourished. So they couldn't live on moss alone. Heather wants to know, are there any invasive um, non-native species that could impact pikas in the gorge? I would bet that in the group of people who call themselves land managers, people who aren't necessarily counting the animals, but they're looking at the the trees, they're looking at the uh, whatever plants are in the area, I bet they are mortified by the non-natives. There is non-native invasive species, there are geraniums that are going in uh, the Angel's Rest Trail <laughs> as we speak, uh, and those will come in on everyone's shoes, probably mine also. Um, so non-natives are uh, non-native plants are a big concern. What if there's something that uh, they don't eat because they have too many, the, the non-native has too many tannins, they can't eat it, yet it takes over their other stuff. Uh, yeah, that, that's a big concern. I'm willing to pay taxes to get rid of non-natives. It is a big problem that we need to pay for. Someone send me a bill, I wanna pay for that. Um, so we're going to take about two or three more, everyone, because uh, we're kind of wrapping up here. Um, again, there's so many questions. It's awesome. And I really appreciate everyone sitting in there. Wow. Great, folks. Um, so let's see here. Is the long call used for a different purpose than the short call? So the short call is e e e, And there's a long call that's done uh, by males and it's done pretty much in the breeding time or and it's a territorial call. So yes, it has a different meaning. It doesn't seem to be warning there's people here. It's advertisement, this is my place. And I can't do a long call because I haven't heard them often enough to be good at it. But uh, Johanna Varner does a wonderful long call and you can look them up uh, and listen to them. I have only heard them a few times. I, I prize the long call when I hear it. It's something like something like that, as opposed to the others are just. And then 
then Ron, assuming that you're still with us, I was wondering if maybe you could touch base on this question. Um, Roger wants to know, the gorge is protected from development. Does that ensure sufficient habitat for pikas? Um, of course, um, lost the, of course, then lost from fire or global warming. Well, those last two caveats are substantial indeed, but I know you know yeah. that. Um, yeah, I think the Columbia River Gorge protections are pretty substantial, but um, I don't think it is ever a good idea to not be on watch for the push to develop and remove uh, wilderness areas and make them into a wonderful house. I don't think it pays to relax on that. However, I do like the protections for the Columbia Gorge, yes. And I'm not an expert at that, by the way. That would be, you know, people from the Columbia Land Trust or yeah. Center no. for Biological Diversity. Um, Audrey wants to know, I work at a university and we created a tracking system for tiger salamanders because they have little to no documentation on their migratory patterns for wintering. Are there any such programs for pika to discover what they do in the winter, where they stay or what they eat, et cetera? Yeah, uh, some of that has been pretty well studied. Um, what they eat is, uh, has been pretty well documented and people feel like, if you read enough journals, you can get a good idea because people will analyze the hay piles and I myself, um, I can, I'm good enough at plants that I can look at a hay pile and I'll write down my field notes. They are eating this, 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 and this. So that part is pretty well established. Um, some groups have done what they call sitting surveys. In fact, the Cascade Pica Watch does two kinds of surveys. One is where you count and see how many live there. Another is where you watch and you see what they do. And when you watch them, you, as a biologist, you're not supposed to, but you will end up naming them and you'll call one um, dented ear and you'll call another one uh, white spot and and so people do have a good pretty not a they have a reasonable sense of what they do in the winter and where they go and the answer is they don't go anywhere <laughs> um, my group with Eric Beaver we found in the hottest parts of the summer hottest days of the summer they will leave the talus patch and they'll go out in the woods sometimes we're walking say oh there's a hundred meters away there's a talus patch walking through the deep shade of the maple trees. Gee, what's that up? Right here. And it seems like as long as they can scurry the rocks pretty quickly, they're okay being outside the rocks for a short period of time. But that's they're fairly well known. What I would love is to take fiber optics and thread them down into the rocks and actually, you know, video where they are. I've never, I don't know of anyone who's uncovered one of their dens, you know, you really wouldn't want to, you'd worry you're gonna crush them or something like that, but it would be kind of fun if you could film them and I've never seen that. All right, we're gonna go with two live questions again. Thank you everyone for saying- Bless your heart, is Natasha wonderful? Because it's so, two more. It's so two tough, more. I wanna go through two everyone's more. real quick. Two more, um, so two more. Are they susceptible to any mammalian diseases? So, of course they are. And what, what you might be thinking, because if, if, uh, um, if you were a student of mine, I would ask this question. I would say, can you imagine any mammal that isn't susceptible to diseases? Of course not. So uh, the, the difference between a wild animal and a human in diseases is the wild animals that are susceptible to diseases, they die off and don't reproduce. And when they do get sick, they die. And humans, you can have a bunch of people who should have died but didn't so um yeah they have a, a robust immune system and what does that tell you that tells you that they're under threat so yes they do get diseases you might have been saying are they vulnerable to crossover diseases from one mammal to another probably no more than anybody else but there are probably you know if you if you take your dog into a vet and they'll say oh well, that's uh, this kind of distemper um, if, if there were a veterinarians for pikas, you would have a suite of things that they suffer from. I'm sure they've got parasites and they probably have fleas and some mites and other things. But uh, other than that, I would call them 
a, a typical mammal, as far as we know, gets sick like anyone else, a bit more robust than humans typically are? Good question. Um, can weasels chase pika through the rocks? Can they get all the way into their dens? Yes, they're thinner than the pikas are. They are mm -hmm. more muscular. They are a member of the weasel family, mustelas, and they are characteristically uh, more ferocious. Of course, they are their predators. Uh, and also predators, typically, uh, they have to rely on physicality and a little more thinking. Mm -hmm. So predators tend to be a little more cagey, a little more smart. Yeah, they, uh, it's no match. If you, if you have a pike, a weasel in a, a habitat where there's pika, it will catch them. And then um, last question. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Stephen. This has been great. Um, you just- I enjoy it. I'm glad right you asked the other. Great job. Um, last question is, what kind of dog do you have? I have whatever kind of dog the shelter has that can run and that uh, likes being with people. Just about any dog, just about any dog. Um, there was a picture of me in their invitation that the Friends of the Gorge sent out, and that's a shelter dog. Um, so you can take a look at that. Cattle dog and pit bull mix. All right, thank you. Alrighty, um, a couple of folks still seen in the comments, but obviously just, just great um, having everyone here. Thank you so much. Um, I see that we still have a few hundred of you with us. So for everyone that's- Oh, wow, end, thank you so much. I can't that's, believe it. <laughs> yeah, that's an hour and a half of learning about pikas. You have done very, very well. And there's a lot more to talk about. There are plenty of things. And it's, uh, I love it when people are interested enough to come to a webinar like this and figure out what's out there around them and not subdue it, notice it and enjoy it. And it's a privilege, a privilege to share that with you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you all for watching. Yeah, thanks so much, Stephen, for joining us. And of course, again, we have the two upcoming ones about the buzz on the bees in the gorge and the wonders of the Western Pond. So again, thanks, Stephen, so much. This has been awesome. You're very welcome. Okay, folks, I'm gonna sign off and thank you all. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.